My name is Stefan Poslat and I'm going to talk a, a little bit about Internet of Things. I feel a bit reluctant to talk to you all about it because I'm sure you know as much about Internet of Things as I do. Um, so the title of my talk is um, What Any Technophile, Somebody Who Thinks Technology is a Force for Good to Improve Society, and Wonders About the Internet of Things. Um, and then to give this lecture, I'm going to ask seven questions, which I hope um, this lecture will answer. And perhaps you know some of the answers to these questions already. So the first kind of question is, um, is IoT, okay, let me just have a look. Is IoT a single broad vision that covers the use of technology? Okay, it's just one vision. <coughs> so. First of all, we can say that um, Internet of Things is, of course, just networked things. We can say that it's a path towards a world of more heterogeneous connected things, leading to ubiquitous computing, computing everywhere. Um, we can say that smart devices are becoming embedded everywhere as part of smart environments. Although <laughs> I have to say that since I've been coming here, and I first taught in this room in 2000, um, the number of smart devices in this room is probably still the same as 15 years ago. Um, so they're embedded in everything and they could be programmed to act automatically without manual triggering. So we could walk towards the door and the door senses us walking towards it and it opens for us. Um, so there are kind of more physical kind of environment things um, that we use in our daily life and I'm going to use these terms interchangeably, right? So things, devices, smart objects, computers, machines, they all mean the same thing. So these are all enhanced with computing and communication capabilities. Um, and the characteristics um, of these IoT things um, and their uses, they vary massively depending on what we're going to use them for. So there's no real single definition of IoT. There are actually just multiple um, visions and multiple definitions. And there's several reasons why there isn't a single um, vision or definition for IoT. Um, the first thing is, is a kind of very um, high level concept um, combining these generic concepts of internet and things. So, you know, that's often a question we could be asked in an interview. What is the internet? What is the Internet of Things? And then look at um, Cisco's definition, right? So instead of saying the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything. I mean, what does that mean? The air is connected to the Internet of Things? You know, the chairs, the ground outside, each leaf on a tree? And um, IoT, although it was a term proposed um, in about 1999, it's still um, evolving. Um, as technology is also evolving, and so its definitions are also evolving. Um, and then the last reason why there isn't any single sort of definition or vision for IoT is there are many stakeholders, right? There are many different application businesses, you know, the kind of car business, the kind of manufacturing business, the smart building business. Um, they all have their own sort of um, fora, they all have their own definitions, they all have their own alliances. They all have their own sort of research design models. They all have different standardization models, bodies. So the approach um, to the issue from different perspectives um, depends upon their specific interests and focuses and background. And that's why we have so many different arch IoT architectural models and so many different definitions and so many different standards. Um, I'm going to give a couple of exercises um, in this course. Um, and then the first exercise I want to look at is what things or networks, right, are used um, in these different application domains. So we have smart outdoors, right, and by smart outdoors we mean things that are, well, they could be in an urban environment, outside buildings, but they could also be in rural districts, right, where there isn't any technology around. So what kind of things and networks do we have there? Right. The second one is smart indoors. So this is the kind of um, IoT of, of the inside of buildings mainly. Obviously, you know, the outside of buildings is connected. Then we have smart transport. Um, we have smart health. 
We have smart manufacturing. We have smart utilities, electricity, heating, water. We have smart people and we have smart cities. Right, so I'd like to um, kind of divide you up into rows um, and I'm going to ask, so let me count the rows, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, you people on the left here, right, you can be rows, you can be one to seven, right, and then everybody else there can, on the right hand side, can be the smart cities, right, so I just want you to have a think for a minute, right, and then come up with, okay, what you think are the kind of key um, networks um, and key things which are being used in these sort of domains. And of course this is quite, um, you know, a uh, wide concept, right? Smart outdoors, you know, could be like environmental sensing for, you know, flooding, tsunamis, um, it could even be smart cities, so it could overlap with um, nine, but it's up to you to have a think. And you can either talk amongst yourselves or um, uh, you can discuss it amongst yourselves or, or just think individually. So please just take a minute and have a think, okay, about what, what we can say are the key networks and the key things in this being used in each of these domains. And then at the end, we're going to have a think about whether um, there's any consensus about what the things and networks are that form the Internet of Things. Okay, so please just take a minute. Right, let's just start to just go through what this list could be. I mean, obviously we could just take lots of time um, over this, but it's just to kind of get a, a, quick, um, a quick feel. So, kind of outdoors, right? So it could be rural out. So let's just say it's rural outdoors, right? In the countryside, away from cities. Where I live, we're probably, you kind of city folk who live in urban areas, um, maybe don't at the moment live. Okay, so what about smart rural areas? What kind of networks would we, we use to interconnect with things? Anybody? Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that would be one obvious thing. Any other thing that we would probably get in rural um, areas? Satellite. Sa satellite, yeah, a bit expensive to um, uh, use, but uh, you're, you're right. In some rural areas where they're kind of key um, you know, installations, you know, satellite um, comms, um, anything else? Long range uh, Wi Fi. Could be long range Wi Fi, um, Wi Max, something like that, maybe. Um, there are some newer variants of Wi Fi, of course, um, which are kind of much longer range as well, um, sort of in the process of being um, standardized. So, you know, that's just some examples. So, so what kind of things, right, um, would be connected in these kind of rural environments that would be useful? Light systems. Light systems. Let me just put the... Uh, anything else? And of course, I could um, spell. You know, that's just an example. There could be many examples, right? So let's. Uh, about traffic information. Traffic information. Mm -hmm. 
Right, what about indoors? Okay, what are the things that um, net key networks we would use sort of indoors? Wi-Fi? Um, what, what else would we use indoors as a sort of network? Bluetooth. We could use Bluetooth. And let me just um, write it as BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy. Yeah, yep, we could use Ethernet. I mean, if we're at home, we could use something like the kind of decked um, phone system. So there are a number of, um, of ones. And of course, we can use GSM as well, which is probably another common one. What about um, what kind of things would we interact with indoors more than we would outdoors? Yeah, they could be indoors and outdoors, I guess. Um, you know, we're privileged in the UK in having so many outdoor um, surveillance cameras that are watching what we do. Yes, that's right, making us more secure. <laughs> right, uh, there's obviously lots of other things. What about transport? What kind of networks would be used um, in transport systems? Um, GPS? Right, it's probably, yeah, it's probably not used for communication, it's used for positioning, but it is a network, that's, that's correct. Yep, so let's just see if we can put GSM everywhere. Yes. And I'm just so lazy, I'm not going to write it down. Uh, automotive radar system. It's all right. Because they, they, they keep the vehicles apart from each other. Do, do you have that um, in... in yeah. Do you have that in your car, Akram? I don't have a car. Oh, OK. Um, uh, yes, ma I'm a green person. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. <laughs> so there could be car rate or any other kind of like um, networks. Rates, wave more rates. How, how do I write that? It's just the acoustics in here. Wave more rates. Wave. More rates. Wave arrays. Oh, excuse me. Not yeah. on rates. On rates. On rates. On rails. Okay. Oh, wave on rails. Yeah. What is this? <laughs> I was thinking that you can use the rails uh, of a uh, train to transport information. You could do. Um, I'm not sure that's. Yes, I think uh, what you mean is uh, communication over cable lines. That's the more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not the rails, it's the cable lines. Yeah, yeah but you can uh, rails. <laughs> rails. <laughs> Right, okay. We, 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 I mean, it's an idea, right? We could, we could use them. Uh, I don't know how, how common that is. What about what are the things that could be connected? Cars. <laughs> well, that's right. So any, any road vehicle, right, could um, be connected um, to here, right? Um, so some of these very, these more kind of more modern vehicles, which I don't personally have, you know, have a GSM modem in them that can connect to the service centre um, and it kind of, they keep sending information to the service centre every so often um, and, uh, you know, if there's a kind of a fault is considered more likely, is a higher risk, it can then be called in, to, you know, to have a service. and. Um, the you know there's a cost obviously in doing that, but um, the thought is that um, you know save money. So there are lots of things. What about um, smart e-health? I know there are various people here that uh, are very interested um, in this application domain. What kind of networks could we have here for smart e-health? We could use Wi-Fi. Well, what else could we use? We could use Bluetooth. You know, we could use those kind of things, Zigbee, those kind of wireless personal area networks, 
and they speak to our phone, etc. What kind of things would we connect up here? Right, any wearables. So, yeah, so something like that, etc. So, I mean, you know, it would take time. We could go through these lists and put other things there. So, maybe we can say that, you know, GSM could be used everywhere in all of these. You know, Bluetooth low energy, a lot. Wi Fi, you know, a lot. Then there are all of these different things. Um, a lot of these connected things depend on the um, application domain. So it's just an example. Um, right, so here's a few um, generic visions which have been proposed, which they could be generic, but they're really application specific. So one of the first um, uh, Visions proposed was global identification of things, and this really came from sort of manufacturing and sort of uh, product logistics tracking of, of products. Um, then we have sort of sensing, sensing the physical environments being stressed while reacting autonomously to kind of events that we process from the sense information. You know, the third thing is the whole world, right? The whole physical world, the whole earth is now, right, some global interoperable standard network, right? Everything interoperates with each other. Um, so we've got the anywhere, anytime from the internet and the slight difference here, right, is anywhere, um, anytime, anything connectivity. Um, uh, another um, th uh, thing that's being emphasized is light or low um, resource communication. So that might be low bandwidth low power communication, might be local, might be remote. Um, another vision is kind of the web of things, right? So the things are now connected using the kind of web protocols, whatever we, we mean by web. You know, do we mean HTML, HTTP? Do we mean XML? Do we mean web services? Do we mean something else? Um, the next thing is about semantic interoperability. So things are going to interoperate based upon an understanding you know, of each other. So the lights in this room could say that um, we're all, the too many of us are on at the moment um, and there's too much light. So we could speak to each other and work out what's the kind of best light setting to kind of maybe minimize the energy expenditure. Um, sort of machine to machine interaction, that would be another example um, there. Okay, and the last one is sort of big data acquisition analytics. So, all of these have been proposed as kind of definitions or visions for IoT. And then we can sort of summarize this in this kind of diagram. So, we've got things and networks on the top, then we've got things split into physical things, which they could be human. Um, then these things have these main features of identifying and tagging, sensing, controlling, or actuating. Okay. And then in terms of connection, we have an interaction without humans. Okay. So it's machine to machine. Maybe these systems are self configuring. Okay. Ecosystems. Um, and then we have interaction, which is human computer interaction, human machine interaction, human human interaction. And then we have lots of different standards for interoperability, for kind of low resource, web of things, semantic web. Right, now the second question is is there any difference, right, between the Internet of Things and the conventional Internet, right? Is it an evolution? Is it a revolution? So we could say that maybe um, the conventional internet on the left, right, is table-mounted application devices, mostly laptops, tablets, um, and on the right the internet of things is maybe thinner, more mobile devices. Um, maybe on the left the conventional internet is more handheld devices, the internet of things is also um, is more wearables. Maybe we could say that the device forms in the conventional internet are planar, right? They are kind of flat, rectangular shapes. Um, whereas on the Internet of Things, we can have non planar devices, right? So smart fabrics, smart skins um, as um, devices. Um, so we can kind of manufacture and print um, kind of 2D forms. Um, but now in the Internet of Things, we can print any 3D form, right? So any shape, 
the device could be any shape potentially. Um, you know, in the old internet, there was about sort of on average less than one device per person, just because some people are in kind of poor rural areas don't have devices. Um, and now perhaps we're moving to 10 to 15 devices per person on average. Um, you know, single mode of interaction, you know, it's either text or it's kind of video. And now we've got multiple modes of interaction, right? I mean, we've got sensors, um, you know, video, um, text being combined. Um, there's fewer de smart devices in the environment versus there's many smart um, device environments. Um, there's limited closed machine to machine interaction, right? So most devices only are hard coded to speak to serve certain servers. Now we've got much more open M2M. Um, we've got limited and so we could say, right, that perhaps um, the things on the right are Internet of Things and the thing on the left is the conventional Internet. Um, another way we can think about this is possibly the Internet of Things is really the conventional Internet, right, plus these kind of newer added kind of evolutionary rather than re revolutionary things. So we can also do a similar thing, right, is the internet different from the internet used for the internet of things so maybe we could say the kind of topology where routers are are sort of fixed um, for um, the uh, conventional internet and um, uh, in the internet of things it's more um, mobile ad hoc sort of any device can be you know a router um, maybe it's more WANs and LANs, right? But maybe, um, you know, uh, here it's kind of wireless personal area networks, um, near field communication, low power wide area networks, low power local area networks. Um, maybe we can say that sort of the network's unconstrained um, in the conventional internet with respect to ICT resources. There's enough memory, you know, enough processing there. Um, so we can use kind of heavyweight network protocols, we can use as much energy as we like and then in the, in the Internet of Things on the right, right, all of these are constrained. Um, maybe we could say that it's important for um, the conventional Internet that uh, we know the addresses, right, um, of the things that are being connected. But maybe we could say that for the physical um, internet, maybe physical addresses are important. Um, a lot of the data generated in the conventional internet is human, so there's like a circadian rhythm with a typical double peak. There's a peak after people arrive at work, and there's another peak right before people leave work, right? There's a double peak. The machine-to-machine -machine kind of rhythm for data exchange is likely to be very different. Um, the data scientists typically, if you send some kind of like web service request, that's something like 1.5 kilobytes, um, the size of the message. Now, if you're sending a temperature reading um, or you're sending an accelerometer data reading, you know, multiple times per second, um, and really you just need a few bytes each time, that's a large consumption, right, of bandwidth. If we use these kind of data application data packet sizes um, for human communication. We use them for machine communication. And um, we could say that a lot of the web uses asynchronous. We kind of um, read and update web pages um, and we need some response back. And we could say that maybe um, Internet of Things is more asynchronous. Um, maybe we could say there's more medium data sets um, in the conventional internet and there's like big data sets um, from more things. Um, and then we could say maybe the data is more structured when uh, a lot of it is for human use and it's kind of more unstructured um, in the Internet of Things. And again, we could say that's the Internet of Things or we could say it's the combination of both. Right, so are there any diff so this is the third question now out of the seven, right? So are there any different technical challenges for the Internet of Things which make it different, right, to the conventional Internet? Um, so we could say that maybe in the conventional Internet things are mostly de designed by companies rather than by communities. They're designed and manufactured by professionals versus amateurs, right? So in the Internet of Things, potentially anybody can manufacture anything okay, and connect it up using a lot of um, quite cheap tools, right? There's many more 
um, low resource things in terms of um, ICT resources, energy, security, right? Unattended things, wireless eavesdropping. Um, maybe the resources are too low for high computation encryption. Privacy. We leave a trail, right? On more and more things, um, and what rights do we have to the data other things collect about us? Um, scalability. So IoT will connect a very dense in space and time number of heterogeneous devices. Interoperability, right? How things are connected. Um, so the typical human machine um, interaction, right, is HTTP stack. Is this good for machine to machine too? Um, also, how do we deal with non TCP IP networks, you know, um, Bluetooth, right? How do we connect that up to TCP IP? Um, how do we deal with inadvertent interoperability? How do we deal with addressing and naming, right? So we have IPv6 in a conventional internet. Then we have electronic product codes for RFID devices, which have a different sort of um, you know, uh, naming and ad identification um, sort of data structure. Um, you know, how do we deal with mobility and how do we deal with address discovery with all of these devices? And what about latency, right? So the dominant model is that these things collect data in a physical environment and they send it somewhere remotely, right, to analyze and to make a decision. Um, this may be too slow, right, for real-time local things to be controlled. Right, so here's just a little example, right? So we have a traffic light. And what we want is the car to speak to the traffic light. What we want the traffic light to do is to tell the car, I'm going to be red for 10 seconds, or I'm going to be red for 30 seconds, so you can switch off your engine. Right now, you may think, right, why should I even bother with this? Because this stop start car technology, the car stops, um, so I don't need the traffic light to tell me to stop, right? I just physically stop. Well, the advantage of this is that now it's safe, right, for the driver to do something else because he knows, or the, dr the driver, he or she knows, right, the car will be notified and won't start again when it's about to change to green. Um, and also another problem with stop, stop start technology is if you stop start quite quickly um, over something less than five seconds, you actually expend more energy than if you keep the engine running, right? So there's a number of advantages to this um, approach. Um, however, the system today, right, and then I'm going to skip through this because this was sort of from a course um, about how we design this. Um, actual today, right, the infrastructure does not allow this, right? Typically today, the traffic lights are connected, are hardwired, right, to a transport authority control center. Um, remotely, so this data right, is stored in this database. Um, and now what has to happen right, is the car has to co connect to the database to get the information about the traffic light. Now, you can, we can probably imagine right, that this is a second, um, this is a second, right? so it's now two seconds to get what the traffic light is. And of course, we know that traffic light can change within two seconds, so this could be quite dangerous. So this is a latency problem. It's the time taken for the shortest message um, to go um, across the network from, from one device to another. Right, and then one last problem to illustrate. This is related to the problems we've just seen. Right, so now we have a car speaking to the traffic light. So say it exists and we can do that. Right, we're at a traffic light. We're at a traffic light crossroads. So, can we identify the traffic light based upon IP address? How can we identify the traffic light, the right one? Right, because actually um, the car, you know, if this is Wi-Fi, um, you know, the car is in range of multiple traffic lights here. So. Um, the network I IP address is at any use. So what about the physical address? What can we use for the physical address? Could we use GPS? Is it accurate enough to tell um, the space apart of these different traffic lights and for us to be closest um, and for us to determine what the closest one is? Um, maybe we need something else. We need to also sense the orientation. So we know the direction the car is moving in. We know also that it's hard-coded which direction the traffic light is facing. 
Um, and another thing that I could have put in this slide is that another problem is what if we're like um, in China where we've now got 10 lanes coming from the left, 10 lanes coming from the right, full of cars, right, equally from the top and bottom. Um, you know, how are we going to deal with the communication? Is that HTTP? So we've got, if not a thousand cars asking these traffic lights, what state are you, right? Um, is that a good way to do the communication interaction? Right, fourth question, right? How many connected things are they? Well, you might have come across um, these stories in the web about how different companies have come up with a calculation. Um, and then one of the ones is that Cisco estimates um, 50 million by 2020 and it actually has a counter that's counting. Um, so the calculation by Cisco is actually an estimate, right? It's not actually connecting, it's not actually um, counting each device connected to the network. Um, and um, the estimate, right, of connected things actually depends upon three things. They've made an assumption about the economy, right, so that the cost of a device today, right, will not change over eight years. That's one assumption. Um, this also depends on inclusivity of society, right? If we just only manufacture um, very highly technology technological things, um, this is going to exclude a lot of society from using them, right? And it also depends upon um, the definition of a connected thing. So how many things do we actually each have, right? And how you know, do we have today, right? So let's look at the computers that we have with us, right? So how many people have, so I'm going to say, I'm going to assume, right, that everybody has one device with them that connects to the internet, right? So how many people have two things? Well, I want to say quarter, right? How many people have three things, right? Four things. Right, I'm going to say that you're all wrong and that probably each of you has 10 things, right, that connect to the internet. But it depends on sort of how you define this, right? So we'll just start, you know, if you start going through your pockets, right? So we've got the phone, right? We could argue that the SIM card in the phone is actually a computer as well as a smart card, so that could be at least two devices. Do we count the fact it's like a quad-core processor, so there are like four, you know, computers in there, do we count that? Um, you know, if you have like a bank card, right, that's a smart card that goes into a card reader, connects to the internet. Um, if you have an Oyster card, smart card, that's another one that connects to the internet, right? The computer actually here is at least two computers, right? There's actually a computer to control um, the battery charger, right? Which is why after a certain number of years, your computer stops recharging, right? The computer, the embedded computer in the battery charger is saying no, and it's saying no because if you recharge too many different ti times, right, the battery overheats and could cause um, some kind of nasty um, physical incident. So we could say that the computer is sort of multiple things. I mean, you know, our kind of like, you know, access card here is like another smart card, and that's like a sort of computer in. Um, I actually have a Bluetooth, I actually have a smart pen here, right, as a computer. Um, it's actually a computer, right, because it's got a USB stick in there, and this is a computer, right? So I can, this computer is only active um, when it's used as a peripheral and put in another device. So that could be yet another sort of you know, device. Then I've got like a few little microcontrollers here. Um, there's another one. Key to the car, right? That's also a network sort of you know, device. And of course, um, another USB stick, right? And if you emptied your pockets, right, you'd probably have up to 10 as well. So we have all of these things. How can we classify, analyze all of these things? 
if this definition of things, right, and if the definition of um, internet is just so vague, right? So it's useful, right, to have some kind of um, framework to talk about things. Um, and I am going to talk about a model called um, the Smart Day Model. So this kind of smart day model says that to classify sort of things and devices in the Internet of Things is basically kind of three basic sort of design patterns, right? Smart devices, smart environments, smart interaction, and this is where this sort of name smart um, day comes from. So smart, right? So smart means that the system devices are digital, they are networked, right? They are active. They are autonomous in that they have some local control, you know, of the resources, the kind of memory, you know, energy, and they're sort of reconfigurable. Um, smart could be used as a weaker form of intelligent, um, meaning that it's sort of artificial intelligence, smart. Um, but if it is to be that kind of much smarter smart, then it kind of maybe needs to understand language. Um, it maybe needs to you know, be able to kind of logically reason and do things like this. Okay, but this is like a weak definition of smart. So we can say that there are three um, dominating um, technology trends. So the first um, trend is we are able to kind of manufacture um, ICT um, resources. Um, in kind of smaller, more complex, more low-cost device packages, right? And um, these can become more and more detached from the physical environment in that because they're smaller, they can be kind of moved. They don't have to stay in the same place. They don't have to be sort of fixed in pace. Um, so we could say that this leads to kind of more complex, mobile, personalized, multitask, you know, smart mobile devices to locally execute services. Uh, so we could say, and then this kind of promotes, right, smart transport applications um, that kind of sense location, determine sort of the rate of change of movement, acceleration. Um, and also, we can remotely access um, spatial information, such as maps and transport information, to you know, find out um, when the next bus is arriving um, in a particular direction that we want to go to in a particular um, bus stop. Um, the second thing is we have an increasing capability to embed or attach devices um, in the physical environment. So, these type of devices, these smart environments, so smart environments is really smart devices which are embedded in the environment, okay, which are normally sort of single task um, devices. Um, and these kind of react um, to um, events that they sense um, in the environment. So now uh, we can have these smart transport apps such as kind of self-driving cars, right? Um, public transport stops show the information um, of actual buses um, not planned. Um, so although we see this in London, um, where I live in the country, we don't have these. Right? Um, and then the third part is that we have more kind of ubiquitous networks, right? It's not just GSM. I mean, the amount of Wi-Fi networks that we can access everywhere that we move, you know, is another example. Okay, um, there's a lot more kind of near-field interaction devices. You know, we can um, pay for lots of things now in many different places just by swiping our card, um, you know, near the payment device. So this covers more the physical environment, and that's an enabler, right? So. This third enabler is leading to kind of smart interaction between more and more devices, between mobile devices, fixed servers, environmental devices. Um, and so this leads to kind of these smart transport apps, so which can um, use a local network um, for the vehicle to interact, um, you know, the bus to interact with the bus stop, maybe. Um, 
traffic lights to detect if buses um, are approaching and give them priority. Okay, we have these different um, forms, and so we could say that each of these, right, is leading to um, this uh, model called the Smart Day model. But the Smart Day model is more than these three um, sort of design patterns. So we can think about um, these types of devices. So we can say that the base type of device right, is a smart device, which means it's autonomous, it's sort of configurable, um, uh, it's active. Right? And we could say that multiple devices could um, interact. Right? So we have multiple devices and we have smart interaction. We could say that um, a subset of a smart device right, is a smart environment. So remember, the smart environment is just a, a physical environment with single task, mostly single task smart devices right, embedded in them. So you know, we have a smart door. So as we walk towards it, it kind of opens for us. Right, the next thing is we have the smart mobile, which um, we know about. We could say the laptop's mobile. I can be using it connected within my Wi-Fi hotspot um, or phone. Um, we can have smart servers, right, that handle kind of multiple access devices for sort of information and sort of processing. Um, we can have combined these, so we can have smart mobile environment. So why is the smartphone a smart mobile environment? Because it has um, up to, well, of the order of 15 different sensors in there, right? We can buy phones with temperature, we can buy phones with atmospheric pressure sensing, you know, accelerometer, you know, gyroscope, temperature, light, sound, etc. Um, we can have um, smart environment servers, right? Now, in this model, right, the thing is the server, right? So, Instead of where the information is being stored is the server, the source of the information is the server, right? So the traffic light is now a web server. It's publishing its state, right? When you do a request from it for the state, it will tell you, I am red. And you could say, I am red for 20 or 30 seconds. Um, we could have smart um, mobile environment servers. Maybe we could say um, a vehicle is this, right? A train, a bus, um, a car that we drive. Um, you know, because it's, it's sensing the environment, um, it's reacting to the environment, it's mobile, and it's a server because it's providing um, data information. So the different types of smart device support different combinations of smart device properties. Um, and then in the book, which I'm not going to talk about here, I say there's these five base device properties being distributed, being intelligent, being autonomous, being context aware, an example of which would be location awareness or time awareness. And the third one is IHCI. So implicit human computer action is just where you interact with something, not using an explicit peripheral device. You use natural interaction. So you know, the gesture um, acts as if in a certain context of the device operation, it triggers a certain action. Um, then and another thing about Internet of Things devices, right, these smart devices, is that we have to design them to, inter to interact with three environments, right? First of all, the environment of ICT, other ICT devices, so we can have multiple device interaction. Then we have to think about physical um, environment interaction. So if we take things outside, we have to look, can we use them in the dark? Um, can we use them while it's raining? Should we use them while we're diving you know, or swimming? We need to think about these things. Um, and the last thing I'm going to talk about is that certain kinds of devices or things, which we call user access devices, of which a mobile phone is an example, these can have seven different form factors. Right, so let's look at things which are kind of user access devices for services. So um, on the y-axis we have the kind of spatial dimensions. Um, is it kind of 1D, is it 2D, is it 3D, right? 
And on the bottom, the uh, x-axis, we have um, what the size of the device is, right? So we could say that the dominant type of device, which um, forms an Internet of Things, are 2D planar devices, right, which are centimeter size to decimeter size devices, right? So they're like a kind of centimeter to 10 centimeter size. So you know, USB sticks, cameras, RID tags, smart cards, phones, games consoles, <coughs> e-books, laptops, tablets, they're all this kind of size. And um, one of the reasons why they're this kind of size and why they're 2D planar is, of course, the display, right? Um, most of the displays are kind of flat, um, and um, they are this size because um, we want something kind of mobile to carry around. So that's why it's this size, right? So what we want to do now, right, and we can call this set of devices here smart tabs and smart pants. Right? So now what we can do now is relax right, some of the form factors um, that are the most common. Right? So we can make larger devices. Right? So we can have kind of smart boards and smart tables, high definition video projectors, ultra high ones. Um, we can have um, organic user interfaces. So our jacket right, could be something that, or clothing or fabric could be something that we sort of interact with. Um, we can have these kind of um, smaller um, wearables, right? So kind of things we can put in our eye, um, things that we put around our sort of wrist, and um, things that we wear on our head, okay? These are kind of more 3D um, interactive devices. Um, another thing is that um, we've got this capability to manufacture mechanical devices just in, to some degree like we manufacture transistors, right? So we can manufacture gyro gyroscopes, accelerometers, magnetometers, motors, sw you know, switches, okay? We can manufacture them in a similar way that we can manufacture um, transistors. Um, and we can manufacture them at that size of scale. So we call this uh, mechanical, uh, we call this microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS. And so MEMS, uh, we can regard really as a kind of smart dust, right? This is kind of much smaller shape. And um, most of the smart dust that we use is embedded in devices like phones and like tablets, right? Although some other researchers, such as Berkeley, you know, have turned these into like environmental devices and they can use optical communication, and they can try and harvest energy. Um, but those are not um, mass um, uh, accessible sort of devices. <coughs> of course, we can go smaller into nanotech, and now we're sort of moving more into sort of carbon materials, carbon interaction. Um, we can do sort of 3D, so we can print uh, any shape as a kind of form factor for the device. Um, and then we can also use this other um, type of thing, okay, called um, containers, right? So the main type of containers we have are for people, for freight, for goods, and for things which people use. So we can make them that smart. So that's smart um, containers. This is called smart clay. This is smart skins. This is smart dust. This is smart tabs, and this is smart pads, right? And these are these kind of device form factors for the Internet of Things. Right, so the last question we can ask is, um, if somebody wants to have a better understanding of Internet of Things, what should we teach and how should we teach this? So, um, the Center for Intelligent Sensing is launching um, a new MSc in the Internet of Things starting um, this September, and this is just an overview of what this course um, does. So. The aim of this course um, is, as IoT researchers and developers, we want to do three things, right? We want to know how to engineer new interactive products and things, right? New smart devices, new smart environments. We want to be able to acquire, fuse, and process the data collected from things, all of these different things. Um, and the third thing is we want to be able to know 
how we can best interact and interconnect um, these different things to form kind of larger, more sophisticated systems, smart interaction. Um, so this is like a web link. Um, and then this is um, the course, right? So we have smart interaction, smart devices, smart environments all linked um, by um, a sort of data model, data science. Uh, this MSC, um, we decided we'd have three streams, right? So first there's like a smart object stream. Um, so here, this is focusing on um, human machine interfaces, interaction, um, embedded systems, smart objects, and interaction with humans. Next we have this sort of um, uh, data processing, you could call it big data variant. So here looking the focus is on the interaction between sort of billions um, of devices and the data they produce, how we exchange that data in the real world. Um, so it's looking at data mining, data analytics. And then the third thing, right, is the intelligent sensing and stream. So this kind of focuses on devices, systems, and services that can communicate and analyze and process and interpret data from multimodal um, sources um, data sources and devices. Um, and then just to have a look, right, so this is an example of two modules. So one of the modules is introduction to IoT, or IoT1. So what is this going to talk about? So one thing it talks about is this um, smart day model. Um, then it talks a bit about um, kind of software management on these devices. Then it talks about these smaller devices, MEMS, right, how um, we can sort of, uh, how, how those are manufactured, how we program them. Then it's looking at sort of microcontrollers, right? So microcontrollers um, is the kind of cut down version of the computer that, that um, controls um, things in the environment. Um, we look at low energy, low power computing. We look at energy harvesting. Um, we look at green and eco-friendly you know, computing. So in part, Eco-friendly computing is linked to low energy computing, but it's not just that, right? I mean, one of the things to think about is, what if we switch from things which are sold in supermarkets with a barcode, right, to an RFID tag, right? And then what happens when we try and recycle the um, bottle, right, with the RFID tag? So the antenna has got you know, tin or lead in there or something like that. Um, you know, what happens when we mix that in with the glass? Can we detach it? If we can detach it, maybe um, you know uh, thieves can sort of switch the kind of pricing RFID tag um, incorrectly. Um, the next thing is to look at multi-device interaction models. So there are things like um, you know, the advanced message queuing protocol and um, this um, MQTT model, which has been promoted by um, IBM, has been standardised. Um, and then looking at fog computing um, rather than um, cloud computing. So what's fog computing? Actually, there are all of these different things, right? I've seen them. Um, I've seen at least sky computing, right? So fog computing is just a more decentralized computing model rather than this kind of remote you know, data server farm, data processing farm computing model. Web of Things is covered here. Um, how is these different types of web of things, like HTML, HTTP, looking at REST um, versus web service um, interaction, looking at constrained right, um, interactions. So co-app is one thing, but there are other optimizations um, you can do. So co-app is a sort of equivalent for HTTP. Um, but it runs over, for example, UDP rather than TCP, which is an advantage for low resource things. Um, anything, right, can be a web server. So how do we design that? Okay, the floor is a web server, the lights is a web server. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, security and privacy. And then mobile services, right, we could say that's the Internet of Things 3. There is an Internet of Things 2, which is about um, communication technology for the Internet of Things. Um, and then this one here, right, um, looking at WLANs, WPANs, WBANs, um, you know, 5G network, WBANs, um, 
vortice service interaction, right? Because you can't, it's likely to be wireless. As there are more and more things, there's likely to be more interference, so we need to have a volatile service implication model. Um, kind of web services on the phone, right, is different to web service design um, on the, um, on like a laptop. Um, one of the reasons why Alphabet, the parent company of Google, overtook Apple, right, um, this year as the world's most valuable technology company, it made a decision in 2014 that it would downgrade um, web services which were offered but which were not mobile device friendly. And um, in the last year, um, they have increased their revenue by 40% due to the fact that they're kind of targeting advertising to mobile device owners. And that's been responsible, um, can be argued, for um, Google, okay, the main conventional arm of Alphabet to you know, enable Alphabet um, to sort of overtake an iPhone. Um, then we look at sort of all operating systems for mobile devices. I mean, one thing that you have to do different in a mobile device compared to a laptop is that you need to schedule and prioritize processes with respect to the energy they use. And um, you can run the CPU at multiple clock speeds, right? So you can save power by, for a low computation process, running the processor slower. And that saves you a lot of energy. Um, Mobiles, um, cards, near field communication, wearables is covered here. Um, you know, smart um, sort of environment interactions, so human machine computer interactions are covered. Um, context awareness, of which location awareness is an example. How do we adapt services? Um, location awareness, mobility awareness, and security and privacy. So that's it. And that's my uh, final slide. So this book which I've written covers all of these concepts. Um, it's in use in over 70 universities worldwide, across six continents. Um, it's heavily cited and second version um, is being written um, to appear in what, seven, it's hidden here, it's 2017. Um, and then, oops. Um, also in here is the link about the courses. Thank you very much for listening.